I saw before our podcast that there was some new research out on ketones related to anaerobic performance when traditionally they've only been associated with aerobic performance. So explain to me what's going on now with ketones and anaerobic performance. Yep. Um, so first and foremost, because ketones are so much more related to fats because fats break broken, you know, gets broken down into ketones and then we metabolize it, right? So then automatically we are thinking that, okay, it must be good, better for endurance because for endurance, we want to tap into that fat. Like you said earlier, RER, you want the RER to go towards fat metabolism instead of glucose because glucose will always be king when it comes to anaerobic because glycolysis gives you that fast ATP without even having to use any oxygen. Right. Right. So that's why nobody has, been, has done anaerobic performance on, on ketones. But then we decided, you know, HVMN as usual, we do some crazy things. We do things that no one wants to do and let's see what the science says. And we partnered with University of North Georgia, one of the best military college in the US, to look at effect on ketone IQ with carbs in anaerobic performance. So what we have done is that we put participants, 18 to 24 year olds, um, on a 5K run. Okay. Immediately after the 5K run, we put them on a, a stationary bike, you know, a go meter, um, and they go. They went through the anaerobic Wingate test. So for those, oh, geez, of you, you guys are cruel. <laughs> I know. You explain the Wingate uh, yes. test to people, because I mean, 5K is tough, but Wingate's really tough. Yes. So Wingate. So these participants have to go through five bouts of 10 second sprints on that bike at 7.5 percent body weight as a load, as a resistance. 7.5 percent of body, your body, body weight. So like body for weight. me, I'd have 100 and 50 watts. Something like that. Yeah. At a, at a, wait, was that, was that the wattage or was that the it's, resistance? It's a resistance. It's okay, a resistance. that was the resistance. That was a okay. resistance. Okay. So, gotcha. so, then, so then during that five bouts, they have 10 seconds sprint, 30 seconds rest, 10 seconds sprints, 30 seconds rest, five times, right? And they got their ketones measured. They got, so they had ketones before the 5K run and then topped up after the 5K run. Okay. Okay. But be, after the run, but before the wind gate. Yes, okay. correct. So during this Wingate test, um, you know, they, ha they, are, they were asked to go as fast, as hard as possible, right? And we just submitted this manuscript to Frontiers in Physiology and they're under review right now. Okay. Um, and we saw increase in average power, peak power and velocity. So not only these people are paddling harder, they're also paddling faster. And on top of that, we also measure fatigue levels because as you go through that five bouts of exercise, you are inevitably going to be more and more fatigued. Yeah. People who are on ketone IQ and carbs, they experience less fatigue than those on placebo. Now, I would hypothesize that part of this would be due to the glycogen sparing effect that occurred during the 5K run, meaning you're burning less glucose during the 5K run. Is there anything else going on there? Like, had you ever thought about doing just the wind gate without the 5K run, Great for question. example? Great question, and I did ask that. So the reason why we did the 5K run is because a lot of other studies, a lot of other studies also did that 5K run, and they saw no, no difference, and we want to sort of replicate that, to build on top of that, because otherwise, other scientists would just scrutinize the paper and say, you know, no one has done this, no, you, can, you can't compare to anyone. So that's the reason we did the 5K. So the next step is definitely better to do just the anaerobic and see what's the difference. And during the 5K run, you were right, we did measure the RER, and people on ketone IQ and carbs have significantly lower RER, meaning they are burning more fat than glucose. So in the placebo group or glucose only group, we are looking at about 0.94 RER, whereas the ketone IQ and carb group, we are looking at 0 0.8, 0 0.89. Okay, RER, by the way, for those of you listening, is a respiratory exchange ratio. It's indicative of the amount of carbohydrates compared to fat that you're burning. Higher RER means more carbs, less fat. Lower RER means more fat, less carbs yes. that you're burning. Yes, Okay. so they're burning more carbs and that is expected. And as you said, um, it could be the glycogen sparing effect. And also because we measure the level of blood ketones before the 5K and after the 5K, and we saw a decrease in the ketones. So together with the RER plus the decrease in ketone levels, we can assume 
or, or, or we can you know, insinuate that these people are burning the ketones, are oxidizing the ketones as well. Mm. However, we are not sure if the ketones are being burned in skeletal muscles, in your heart, or just simply lost via acetone in the breath. Okay. So that, you know, whoever who's listening in terms of researchers, that's the next step we got to, got to measure, right? Like, what are we measuring? What are we looking at, at muscle biopsy? You know, then we can look at really the glycogen sparing effect. What about, what about the brain? Like, is there anything going on in the brain? I was just about to say that. So, so the next reason that we think that could be why these people are performing much better at anaerobic exercise is not simply the glycogen sparing effect because this could have a potential analgesic effect on the brain. So it, it basically, it's a pain tolerance increase after taking ketone IQ and carbs during this because the whole Wingate test is meant to elicit a huge shift in pH, i.e. lowering the pH, increasing lactic acid buildup, and having excruciating pain and possibly vomiting, uh, 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 you know, and, and pain in these sort of like target muscle groups. So having said that, if people are able to push through that, push harder and faster and feeling fatigue less, um, then it could possibly having a direct effect on the perception of pain itself. Now, if you compare this to ketonester, it may not be a good combination because anaerobic itself, like I said, it's meant to elicit a huge shift of pH and ketonester on its own is able to already drop pH so it's much. Accelerate that pH shift. Yeah, that people might just feel really awful. And coupled with the bad taste, they might actually have GI issue, which could also lead to an overall decrease in performance in the study, which a lot of studies have showed. Um, they, the, the drop in performance is because people started vomiting, started you know, not, doing, not feeling well in general. Now, one of the reasons that you see kind of like a shift in focus sometimes after you work out mm -hmm. is I think in some scenarios, probably due to an increase in blood ketones due to potentially glycogen exhaustion or increased fat utilization. But then there's also this idea that in addition to ketones being one of the preferential sources of fuel for the brain, lactate is another. And you see lactate crossing the blood-brain barrier and being used as an alternative fuel to glucose yep. for the brain. Now, based on that, is there something to be said for what might be occurring from a lactate standpoint here for the brain? Or, or have, have, like, is there any studies you guys have done on, on lactate as related to neural performance or anything of the like? No, we haven't actually looked. Um, I mean, we did measure their lactate. I don't think their lactate is that much different between the two groups, but we definitely see an increase in lactate during the anaerobic exercise, which we already expect. As to directly into the brain, we didn't measure that. Um, but it is an interesting point because I published a paper last year, a review paper on traumatic brain injury and exploring the roles of both ketones and lactate in helping both the recovery and the mitigation of damage of traumatic brain injury. Were you giving people lactate and ketones? It was a review paper. So okay. basically looking at all the literature so far as to what we know, what happens in metabolism when you have a traumatic brain injury, mm -hmm. and why we came to a conclusion that ketones and lactate may be able to help with that. Ketones are something that come to mind for TBI and concussion, because if you look at, for example, Dale Bredesen's book, The End of Alzheimer's, there's a whole multimodal approach to Alzheimer's or other dementia-like conditions that include you know, high amounts of DHA, hyperbaric oxygen, adequate hydration, the use of uh, intranasal light or intracranial red light therapy for the brain, and a, I, I believe either coconut oil or MCT oil or possibly ketones, I don't recall, were one of the strategies used for, uh, for TBIs, for concussions, and I've also seen some indications for other neurodegenerative conditions. What, what's going on with ketones in the brain? So we are actually um, going to launch a pilot study on TBI together with the Naval Health Research Center uh, to look at specifically ketone IQ, the effect of ketone IQ in recovery of TBI patients. 
Um, and there's a, a university, University of Western Australia in Perth. I spoke to um, the clinician as well a few days ago, and they are going to start a study on TBI using ketone IQ as well. So stay tuned on that. But as far as what we know so far on TBI, what happens when, t when TBI, when you have a concussion, when you have a traumatic brain injury, within the first 48 hours, what they have seen is the hypermetabolism of glucose. Your brain starts taking in all the glucose, right? And some people say because you need an increased energy because you know, there's the damage going on. But there are some scientists who, shown, who has shown that the glucose is being pushed towards the pentose phosphate pathway to create more NADPH, which could be helpful with the mitigation of the damage. Yeah. And then... NADPH being able to have a protective effect correct. for mitochondria. Neuro, neuroprotective effect as well. So, and then weeks to months after, in fact, seven days after, they saw a decrease in, in glucose metabolism because you can only ram something up so far up before it goes back down because that's what the body does. You know, we always yeah. stay in homeostasis and really you know, modulate the metabolism. So when glucose goes back down in seven days, they saw a huge increase in lactate up to like 60 plus percent uh, metabolism being uh, relying on lactate showing that there is still an increase in energy, but somehow the brain capacity to upregulate glucose metabolism is, is now not able to be maintained. Mm. And then right after that, like, you know, if you look at TBI patients, you know, years after, they also experience somehow uh, a hypo metabolism of glucose, meaning that they're not as efficient in metabolizing glucose. And this is very similar to neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, why they call it type three diabetes is yeah. because there is some form of insulin resistance where the brain is not being able to uptake and utilize glucose as efficiently as a normal human being. So that's where ketone com ketones come in, right? First and foremost, ketones are brain's super fuel, like it's a brain's preferred fuel. So when it's present, the brain will take it up. So because ketones are being shuttled in via MCT, which is monocarboxylase um, transporter, it's different to glucose transporters, which are glutes, right? So it's coming in from different shuttles, different channels. So it can bypass that whatever insulin uh, resistance you have. Secondly, we're looking at the anti-inflammatory properties of ketones as well. Mm. The direct effect on, of ketones on LRP3 inflammasome could also potentially help with both mitigation of the damage as well as recovery down the road. That's so first of all, is the energy deficiency gap that may be um, compensated with ketones and lactate, and then two, the anti-inflammatory properties of ketones. Why do some people still say that glucose is the preferential fuel for the brain? I mean, under normal circumstances, the glucose does use a lot. I mean, sorry, the brain does use a lot of glucose, right? But then how many people, like how many studies are there that shows that you have high glucose and high ketones and then the brain preferred ketones? Like what we know is that ketones and brains and whatnot, when ketones are, when ketones are present, the brain and the heart will always take up uh, ketones. And what's more interesting is that, uh, I know for a, for, for a sure in the heart, is that when the heart takes up ketones, it's proportional to the availability of ketones in the blood. However, this is independent of the uptake of other substrates, meaning that when they measure the, vena, uh, the arterial blood and the venous blood, so blood going in, blood going out, the uptake of glucose and fats remain the same and ketones go up. And this is especially important for a failing heart because you are essentially providing more energy because it's uptaking more um, uh, substrates and providing more energy to the failing heart. And we know in heart failure, the heart uh, actually upregulates ketone metabolism. I didn't realize how applicable this was to heart disease. This, this is fascinating.